Today I'll take up discussion of uh, some special laser structures uh, which have been grown by uh, liquid phase epitaxy and later by MOVP. I will start off with the simplest laser structure uh, which are the etched uh, MISA buried heterostructure. I'll then discuss uh, a double uh, channel planar buried heterostructure DCPBH. And these are basically lasers with Fabry Perot cavities, okay, with um, cleaved surfaces which form the cavity. Uh, these have some disadvantages in that there is some mode hopping, um, there is temperature dependence of uh, the frequency. And so the advanced laser structures that I'll talk about today are distributed feedback lasers, DFB, and distributed Bragg reflection, DBR. And also there is another uh, very uh, fancy laser that was made. It's called C-cubed laser. Called It's cleaved coupled cavity lasers, which have really not uh, found the applications. But anyway, I'll, I'll, so today's lecture will be more descriptive, and it will talk about how uh, the, these lasers are uh, fabricated. So the first laser I'll talk about is... Um, plan of today's lecture, we'll talk about EMBH, H MESA buried heterostructure, then double channel planar buried heterostructure, DCPBH. These are with Fabry Perot type cavities. And uh, after that, I'll go on to discussion of DFB. DBR and C cubed uh, lasers. Okay. Let's start with a simple uh, device, etched MESA buried heterostructure, which I've drawn the diagram. And you can see this is reasonably easy to fabricate even by liquid phase epitaxy. And if you look at this, you find that you have a substrate. And we'll go through the steps one by one, uh, on which you grow an epitaxial N plus indium phosphide layer, 2 tenth of R18. Then the whole structure is grown by, say, liquid phase epitaxy. You have an active layer, which is, um, in this case, it'll be undoped indium gallium arsenide phosphide with the right composition to give emission at 1.3 or 1.55 microns. It's a double heterostructure, so this active layer will have a smaller band gap. Okay. Then here's a P indium phosphide and P plus indium gallium arsenide phosphide heavily doped to give low resistance contacts. Okay. This whole, whole structure is grown then you see why is it called MESA because this is the active region is delineated by etching. Okay. You have a mask here and this is prevented from etching but the rest of this, this whole area is etched okay. and then you have regrowth of these layers. Okay. So this requires for two-step liquid phase epitaxy or two-step growth. You grow the whole structure, you know, like this, then you etch these regions and you regrow. And uh, you can see these are back bias PN junctions. So it is forming, uh, it is uh, performing the same function as a, a stripe geometry. Okay, if this is very small, okay, if you make ohmic contact, then these are back biased. So the, this is isolating, this is called junction isolation. Okay, this is the junction. So when you put a bias here, Okay, if you put a bias here, then obviously this is forward bias, then this junction is reverse bias, and there's no current. So this is junction isolation. And obviously this N plus indium phosphide, this is a substrate. This is again to make uh, low resistance ohmic contacts. Okay, so let's uh, look at the structure of uh, this. What is, this is the substrate. How many epi layers are there? There's one, two, three, four four epi layers, okay? Uh, 
this N plus indium phosphide. Uh, typically, it could be doped with uh, uh, tin, um, usually uh, something like tin. Uh, it could be sulfur, selenium, tellurium. Then the active layer is undoped, which is about 10 to the power 16 uh, calorie concentration. Uh, P plus in gas would have a carry concentration of the order of, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come to this. Uh, these are sort of cladding layers to form the heterojunction, and this is a nomic contact layer. Okay, so let, what are the steps involved? So overall, there are four AP layers. And Bell Labs, uh, Nila Dutta, et cetera, they, they fabricated this by liquid phase epitaxy uh, a long time ago. Okay, um, first is the N indium phosphide buffer. Two tenth of power 18, as I said. Thickness of the order of three to four microns. Whereas the substrate is obviously something like a, um, 350 microns. Okay. Next layer is undoped, is the active layer. Indium gallium arsenide phosphide. Uh, undoped meaning uh, the carry concentration would be something like 10 to the power 15 or 16. Not too critical because electrons and holes are, this should not be heavily doped. Okay, so uh, the electrons and holes will be injected from the, and the thickness is typically double heterostructure, so 0.2 microns is uh, sort of optimum thickness. Then the P indium phosphide. This is called uh, cladding. Like optical fibers, the, you have the core and the cladding, the same sort of idea. Carry concentration something like 10 to the power 18. Okay. And um, the thickness is again about the order of two microns. Incidentally, this composition, uh, 1 minus x, x, 1 minus y, y, this composition is such as to give emission at 1.3 microns. Okay. So the, the composition uh, x and y are chosen to give. So the band gap is determined by this. Obviously, lambda 1.3 microns means the band gap is of, of the order of uh, 0.9 eV. Thereafter, uh, you have a P plus indium gallium arsenide phosphide contact layer. Again, you, you can specify uh, the carrier concentration is something like 10 to the power 19 to give low resistance uh, ohmic contact. And here, we can say lambda, the composition is such is 1.1 micron, okay, this sort of, uh, the band gap is accordingly about 1.1 eV. Uh, and this thickness is typically about 0.5 microns, okay, this, this top layer. So uh, this is not, not drawn to scale. This is about 2 microns, this is 0.2 microns, uh, this is 2 microns, and this is about 0.5 microns. And, uh, why is this P plus uh, so heavily doped? Because uh, the contact resistance of, of uh, P type materials is always a little higher than that of N type. One of the reasons is obviously that the mobility of holes, okay, if you have the same carrier concentration, mobility of holes is a factor of 10 uh, less, so obviously the contact resistance. So often the heating takes place here. That's why in many cases when you make the device, okay, the, see the active layer is quite close to here. So that's why you reverse it and, and you bond it with, with this side down. 
okay, on, onto the substrate. Okay. Um, so these are the growth steps. Uh, what are the other fabrication steps? The other fabrication steps are that uh, mesa etching is one critical step with masking, etc. Uh, these are, you know, obviously two to three microns depth. Um, these are fabricated uh, using bromine methanol etchant. Okay, this is standard etchant for three fives. Okay. Um, before that, in fact, you have PCVD silicon dioxide as mask. Okay. Uh, and uh, with the right geometry of uh, two microns. Okay. Then you have a second. Uh, growth step. Okay. After etching, you have second growth step uh, in which you grow P-indium phosphide and N-indium phosphide. These are called blocking layers. By, uh, by second stage LP. Okay. This is two stage LP growth. So, Remember, the second stage of LPE growth is on a non-planar substrate. Okay, so it's not a. You have etched this. You have etched this. So, this, so the uh, when you're growing, you're growing on something like this. Okay. So you must have growth on this non-planar substrate, which is uh, you know it, it requires some skill. However, these are not active layers. Okay, so it does not matter if the quality is not very good, but you have to have nevertheless have to have a junction. Uh, it, this is I've mean, exaggerated it. It's slightly, um, you know, uh, inclined. Um, it's uh, partly due to having a preferential etchant, which uh, you know, which uh, etches uh, fast in a particular uh, crystalline orientation. Okay. So the second, uh, these layers are grown by a second step LP, which is. Uh, little more difficult than growing on a, on a planar substrate. Of course, remember, this is exaggerated. This, this depth is a couple of microns, okay? This is only a couple of microns, okay? This is 0.2, this is 2, this is what, 0.5. So this depth is only, say, 3 microns. But nevertheless, you have to grow on, on this depth surface, okay? And uh, then you have uh, contact metallization. And uh, then cleavage to form the Fabry pair of cavities. And typically, uh, uh, these layers have, uh, these lasers have threshold currents of the order of 10 to 15 milliamps, which is reasonably small. And our out power output is something like 10 milliwatts per facet, which is, which is uh, reasonably good. This is at uh, 30 degrees centigrade. So these are relatively simple lasers. The, the geometry is, is not very complex, and it can be grown by it can be grown by LPE. There is no very thin layer which requires MOVP or um, um, MB. Okay. Uh, now going to a slightly more com complex structure, DCPBH, double channel planar buried heterostructure. First, uh, this is. The geometry is a little more involved. Again, uh, there are two LP growth steps. Let me draw the structure. Um, okay, double channel means that the the active layer is okay. Uh, this is exaggerated. Is sandwiched here. 
between between two channels which uh, isolate the active layer and if I draw the geometry properly okay then you have symmetrical okay so have a uh, full diagram that I'll show later, but this is um, the actual structure of the device. So. Um, this is n indium phosphide substrate. layer okay then this is uh, the isolation this is p indium phosphide this is n indium phosphide this is p indium phosphide again you have blocking this region is, is blocked this is p again indium gallium arsenide phosphide this stands for double channel planar buried heterostructure okay so this is the active region and um, the actual uh, layer uh, compositions are almost the same as in uh, the case of the uh, etched mesa buried heterostructure. I think I have a better to for you to see. Can you see this? Okay. At least it gives you the overall if you etch these uh, these are H double channels, okay, and if you s look at this, uh, you have this is the active region, okay. This is this active region over there. Then you have this N indium gallium arsenide phosphide cladding region, okay. This is uh, N indium phosphide on Okay, then the substrate, then you grow this N-indium phosphide, active region, and on top there will be, okay, this will be P-indium phosphide, and this is P-indium gallium arsenide phosphide. So it's exactly the same as before. And here you, you make these grooves, and here you grow P-indium phosphide and N-indium phosphide, okay, and uh, this region is P-indium phosphide, okay, which is um, this is P indium phosphide, okay. This is also P indium phosphide, okay. Um, and this is the active region, N indium gallium arsenide phosphide. Okay, now if you look at the steps that will make the fabrication clear. You have again DCPBH, two stage epi layer growth, okay, four epi layers, four, okay, as for EMBH, okay. Uh, so 
so the epi layers are uh, this this almost the same as before um, as for EMBH. Then what are the additional steps? The top indium gallium arsenide phosphide layer removed using etchant H2SO4 H2O2 plus H2O 10 is to 1 is to 1 ratio ok then two channels three to say five microns wide etched as before using PCVD SiO2 as mask. Why PCVD SiO2? Yeah, PCVD gives lower temperature of growth, okay? You don't want to disturb the um, the epi layer structure. So the growth is 250 or 300. If you do ordinary CVD of SiO2, it could be seven or 800, okay? Sometimes, you know, in order to avoid, say, phosphorus out diffusion, you can take SiO2 doped with phosphorus, okay? You intentionally put, put a little bit of phosphorus to avoid uh, out diffusion of phosphorus, okay? Then you remove mask. And then the next uh, epi layer uh, steps, okay, uh, this, this, is, this is called uh, uh, sometimes regrowth. After etching, you have a non-planar substrate, and then you grow four epi layers again. Okay, here you etch and you grow okay, one, to, uh, let's see, no, up to here is the same, okay, up to, up to here is the same. Then you regrow one, uh, one, two, three, four, okay. So you, these, these are the re regrowing layers. So you regrow uh, P indium phosphide, N indium phosphide, indium phosphide and then P plus indium gallium phosphorus. This is the contact layer. So this is a, um, a little more um, complex geometry if you can see. channels and this is the active region. So the current is confined, okay. Here you the isolation is even better than in the MISA structure, okay, where it's uh, multi-layered and the current is confined in, in the central region. Uh, this is called the active region. Then you have the guiding region, okay. Uh, metallization and cleave will give you the device. But uh, for example, this, you can see these grooves here, okay. So this is a, this is for distributed feedback. This is not only a DCP DH, but it's also DFD with distributed feedback. So uh, the light is being continuously uh, reflected, and feedback occurs due to uh, this grating, which is which is etched under the junction. And you can see this. You know this. This is going to be uh, quite complex. Uh, you etch this and regrow on top of this. Uh, so. That's the next laser structure I'll, I'll, I'll come to. The problems with um, um, Fabry-Perro lasers which the l cavity length is determined by the um, 
cleavage and the facets, the problem is that obviously you have you can have many uh, longitudinal many longitudinal modes possible. So it can um, then the temperature dependence of E G. gives you um, djth dt is a fairly large. So that is one disadvantage and uh, you can also have um, a number of modes that can be sustained. So With increase of current or with change of temperature, you can uh, get switching over from one mode to another. So that is determined by uh, because you have uh, Fabry Ferro type of cavity. So obviously, the idea was that can you use some other kind of feedback? After all, the cavity, what is the cavity doing? Um, you have mirrors and the light is going uh, back and forth. And this is, so the path length in the gain region is increased and this is providing optical feedback. So instead of having reflection only at the ends, at the mirrors, can you have uh, reflection throughout the length of the uh, cavity? And in that case, the wavelength will not be determined by the length of the cavity. Okay. In this case, you know, uh, twice L is integral number of uh, lambda. Since lambda is small, you know you can always get the switch shift from m equal to zero, or, you know m equal to one to m equal to two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, the idea was that suppose you have a structure like this distributed feedback using a grating. So this is kind of what is known as a DFB type of laser. And the feedback obviously is due to refractive index variation. Periodic, periodic refractive index variation in the propagation direction. So the typical geometry of a laser, uh, just to sketch the principle of it, will be uh, the, the layer structures could be quite similar. Uh, you have here N, okay. then you may have whatever structures you have an active layer and then obviously you have a, a P type region on top. Okay. And what is done is here you have a, just above the active region you have a periodic uh, grating. Okay. With a particular period etched. So the refractive index here and the refractive index here are different. So the light is, is propagating and uh, you have the Bragg condition for mth order. Okay. Uh, Capital uh, lambda is m lambda by twice mu, where m is the mode number, mode index, say. Uh, okay. uh, and is the mode k 
okay order lamb mu is mu bar is the refractive index and uh, delta is the period of the grating okay yeah this so the reflection does not take place right at the ends but it takes place right throughout and this is determined by the geometry okay so obviously it will not depend so much on uh, the exact reflection coefficients here uh, or the change of refractive index with temperature etc etc that depends upon the you know the geometry this has to be very precise this, um, this, uh, the, the exact, yeah, we are uh, correct. This period delta has to be exact for for the entire period. Okay, so it has to be um, very uh, accurately made. Uh, let's take this example for uh, 1.55 micron indium gallium arsenide phosphide laser. What is the value of delta? That itself is is quite important determine whether you can make it. Let us take m is equal to 1. Refractive index, effective refractive index is 3.4. Okay. Then um, this is capital lambda, right? This, this, um, this turns out to be, if you take uh, that relation, m lambda by 2 mu, turns out to be 0.23 micron. So this is a this is a, you know sub micron. Okay, so uh, earlier all the other dimensions of the device are you know few microns. Okay, uh, so here you have to uh, delineate a dimension which is sub micron and very accurately. So how is this done? Okay, obviously one direct technique is how how so the question is how do you form the grating? So this is a, quite a sophisticated device. Firstly, because the grating has to be formed accurately, and secondly, after the grat the grating is formed, okay, the grating is formed. That means you ha you have to etch you have to etch right up to near the junction, okay, and then on top of that you have to grow this layer, okay, and this is the active region. So you know the regrowth on top of the grating is going to be is quite difficult. Um, however, it has been mastered. Uh, what is one possible is just e beam okay e beam writing you know electron beam can get you down to uh, electron beam masking the point 0.1 micron okay e electron beam writing on a, on a mask followed by uh, chemical etching and regrowth That is a, a standard technique. Um, one of the adva advantages of this uh, technique is that this delta can be, um, you can do this calculation okay, and after the, even after the growth, Suppose you want to make a, uh, you know, mu mu bar. Okay. Suppose you want to make a 1.3 micron laser. Okay, um, so you you put lambda is equal to point 1.3, and it'll give you some value of delta. Suppose of the same structure, you know, dif different uh, piece. You want to make a 1.55 mi micron laser. Okay, so the same same uh, layers. You put in lambda is 1.55. Okay, and you get this value. So this um, um, etching step is determining the frequency the wavelength at which the laser works okay so that that is uh, the ad advantage in um, defining the wavelength of the laser 
the other method is obviously uh, holographic writing, holographic technique. Okay. Uh, use interference. on photoresist and for this you have to use a short wave wavelength laser interference using what laser you have to use a short wavelength laser uh, a UV laser typically a helium cadmium laser which has a lambda of the order of about 0 0.0 to 0 0.3 microns so uh, the, uh, the idea here is that You have a photoresist, and uh, you have, um, say, uh, you make a holographic pattern here. Interference here between two beams coming, um, okay, one direct beam and one uh, beam through a you have another beam which is coming having been reflected okay, off the holographic uh, mass okay. and here you will get you will the light intensity you know will go like this okay. so where the light intensity is large there you will you will get you know etching okay. here you will get and of course, here the advantage is you can get the light intensity can vary you know, sinusoidally. Okay. So here you will get more etching, okay. and here you will get less etching. So as a result of this holographic grating, you will get if the light intensity here is high, then this will be more etched. Okay. So you will get a pattern of this type. Okay. So. Um, this is the other uh, alternative uh, way of uh, making the holographic, uh, uh, making the um, grating. Okay. Um, let me just come to what is a DBR. There's only a little subtle difference with the DBR laser. DBR is distributed Bragg reflection. The conditions are the same. The only difference is the geometry here is that here you have the PN junction, okay. here you have the active layer, and the grating is, is outside So the grating is not made uh, in this active region. Okay. One thing to remember is that uh, how does this work? This works because remember the what, what the light intensity. Okay, it depends upon the confinement factor. Okay, the light intensity is not all in this active layer. The light intensity is like that. Say, okay. so the light that is leaking into this uh, cladding layer okay that is uh, coherently reflected okay so this active region is very small so it is this uh, leaky wave which has gone into this uh, grating layer which is uh, um, being periodically reflected and uh, giving you the modal pattern okay so the DBR uh, laser, the advantage is that uh, the active region and the grating region are separated in, in space. So, you, you know, you, uh, in making this grating, uh, you are not going to affect this active region. And uh, 
overall, what are the advantages of, of these lasers? Uh, it can be summed up by this diagram. If you look at, obviously, the, the uh, stability of the modes and all will be much larger. Suppose we plot JTH, amperes per centimeter squared against temperature, okay, 200 to, say, 500 degrees K. For the um, fabri perot laser, okay, the variation will be something, with, it, this is about 10 to power 3 amperes per centimeter squared. This is something like, um, like this for the fabri perot For the um, DFB, th this, to start off, it is it's lower, and then, you know, it's something like that. What about the uh, uh, mode hopping? It turns out that for the Fabry Perot, you can have different modes, which, depending upon temperature, this is a TM mode. Okay, uh, this is a TE mode. So as the temperature changes, you can switch from one mode to the other. For for the DFB laser, these changes are much less. This is a TE mode. Okay, this is the TM mode. So the variation of the modal pattern as well as JTH is much less, and the main reason is that the for the Fabry Perot, the modes are determined by DEG DT. Whereas for the DFB lasers, the properties are determined by, by the grating, and the grating depends upon the refractive index. So here it depends upon DN DT, variation of refractive index with temperature. Okay? So this is much less than the variation of DEG by DT. So the temperature dependence of this DFB or DBR lasers is much less than the temperature dependence of the uh, fabric barrel lasers. So these are fairly established now, although they're more complex to make, they're fairly uh, um, established. And one can, this is, I don't know if you can see this, uh, this is a distributed feedback buried heterostructure laser. You can see it's, it's fairly complex. Okay, you have a corrugation grating, a zinc diffusion region, then this is the waveguide, n indium gallium arsenide phosphide, then n indium gallium arsenide phosphide active layer, okay, which is here, okay. then in n indium gallium, this is buffer, then of course the omic contacts are gold, yeah, okay. and these are, are the blocking regions, okay. and on top you have this gold and SiO2. Uh, just to finish off, since I'm, uh, I started off with the C-cube laser, the C-cube laser is something like this. Okay. Uh, cleave coupled cavity. So what is the idea? The idea is that you have um, two cavities, slightly different uh, geometry, okay, slightly different length, with a very narrow uh, gap. And there is... The smallest cleave cavity, cavity is about 30 to 50 microns, heat sunk. This was uh, invented by Sang at Bell Labs. Uh, it, it was this L1 and L2 are different. Okay, so if L1 and L2 are different, the modes of this and this are slightly different. Okay, so for example, the mode of one would be say these. Okay, FC1 of one, and the FC2 of the other one would be something like this. Okay, slightly different. And only, yeah, only the modes which are common to, there will be one or two modes which are common, say one in ten, this one, same frequency in both. Okay? So the, it is like two couple circuits, okay, which have one common frequency, and so this cleave cavity will only oscillate in this mode, which is common to both. Okay? So very high Q. Okay? So it's very high Q, very stable uh, laser. Um, but it's rather difficult to make using this. Uh, this alpha has to be very small, so the light must leak in. You know, it must be of the order of wavelength, so it must leak in from this cavity to the other. Uh, all four facets are cleaved and parallel. Okay, can you imagine? So, 
know, they have to be exactly cleaved in parallel. So it's rather difficult to make. Uh, this has been demonstrated, but actually uh, this is not a